Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode six of The Pragmatic Investor. Today, I'm joined by fellow essay contributor Michael Wiggins. He is the author of Deep Value Returns, and he is an expert on energy, tech stocks, and the energy transition. Now, today, we had a great conversation about the future of energy. Uh, we talked about specific sectors such as natural gas and uh, uranium and nuclear energy. And we also even talked about some tech stocks like Airbnb. I really enjoyed this conversation with Michael, and I'm looking forward to doing it again. Now, as always, if you enjoyed the podcast, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And remember that you can find me on Seeking Alpha, James Ford, The Pragmatic Investor, and you can also find me on Spotify and YouTube, where I also do regular weekly videos. As always, I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. All right, welcome. I'm joined today by Michael Wiggins. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. Great. So you are the um, you are deep value returns on Seeking Alpha, focusing on energy, commodities, and stocks. Um, I'll start you off with an easy question. Uh, what is the energy of the future? Oh, thank you so much for asking that question. So the way I see it is that at this moment in time, there's two opposing trends happening in the world. Uh, we're trying to decarbonize our fossil fuel energy supply. So let me just make this really simple. Around the world, approximately, depending on the country, but approximately, vaguely speaking, 60% of our energy comes from fossil fuels. That's coal, natural gas, and heavy oil, 60%. We're trying to go and decarbonize those energy sources, okay? So 60%, we want to bring that down by 2050. At the same time, we're trying to roll out our renewable infrastructure. So this is uh, solar panels predominantly and wind turbines. Now, the way it works is that if you want to, for example, if you want to make a wind turbine, um, the way to go about it is that you, you would build it outside of the city. So let's say, for example, mm -hmm. um, you build it offshore, just for, for the sake of our discussion. So that is one wind turbine has about 250 tons of steel. That's for one. And you need them quite separate because of the way the wind goes through them. So if you're going to make a farm of, let's say, 10 of them, you have a lot, a lot of tonnage, and it's outside of the city. Now, here's the problem. You go from the center of the city to the middle of the city, where there's a lot of energy density, you need to transmit. So you need to kind of have the infrastructure in place that you are taking that intermittent source of energy, and you are taking it to the center of the city. So you need to, by definition, it's intermittent. So today it's quite windy, you might have a lot of uh, wind out there, but you don't need that much energy today, you need it tomorrow. So how do you store that? Okay, so that's the first one. If you need to store that energy somewhere. Lithium batteries seems to be one solution. It's not the only solution, it's one solution. So, but let's say you, you need it in Omaha today and you need it in New York tomorrow. So how do you figure that out, right? So you need to figure this out by rewiring all that electrification uh, to along the points of contact. So for example, it's not just that you have it at the end of where the, the wind supply, uh, where the wind energy is being made, you might have it along the electrical grid, the storage of that, uh, that, that energy supply. Now, a few more problems here. To build the wind turbine, you need a lot of steel. Steel is made with metallurgical coal. So that's quite energy intensive in terms of fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to decarbonize on the one way, and on the other way, we're saying, okay, actually, we're going to have a lot of renewables. But the difference between an aspiration and reality is the physical will. So the physical will needs to basically say, okay, we need to have actually more fossil fuels to ramp up this production. For example, if you're going to make um, like a solar panel, that also has a lot of steel, it has a lot of glass as well. So to make mm -hmm. glass, you need a lot of natural gas. So mm -hmm. it's one thing to say, oh yeah, we're going to build all this, that, and the other. It's another thing to actually physically build that. So that's the first thing that is quite important. Okay. Now mm -hmm. the other thing is that you are going to have a scenario where typically right now uh, that coal plant will be close to the city. And it's, let's say, in one location, not too far from the city, right? Because you want to just transmit that across. But you might have that solar panel out in a farm somewhere that is actually quite different. So you need to get all the copper wiring to go mm -hmm. from the place where it's generated to the place where it's required, okay? So this, this is a few things. 
The next thing that's quite important is, I don't know if you're following the news lately, there's a lot about deglobalization. So there's a lot of mm-hmm. geopolitical tensions. Now, I don't, I'm not about, I don't care about that ge- geopolitical tensions, but it is a fact of the matter. I have to think about it as investors. Now, China right now is saying, okay, uh, we don't really want uh, the West to dictate the terms of our economy, okay? So they are trying to be more of a service-based economy. And you've seen that in the last several months, how things have unfolded in terms of the energy trade, sorry, the, the China trade has kind of died out a little bit. In certain mm-hmm. areas, like travel's done really well in China, the service areas have done really well, but the old manufacturing areas haven't done really, really well. And very few people are thinking about this, but the reason why that's happening is that there's a decoupling away from China. In 2021, when everyone was stranded and everyone's trying to get those supplies out from China, it was just a mass chaos. So from Apple to Tesla, many of these companies are saying to themselves, okay, you know, we are going to take all our supply away from China. We might keep some there, but we're going to kind of decouple away. So you're going to have to rebuild that a lot in the U.S. because Mm -hmm. the U.S. has several advantages. First, the U.S. has the CHIPS Act. This is to reshore the semiconductor industry. It also has the IRA, Infrastructure Reduction Act. So these are two bills that are very, very important to motivate the construction of the industries back home in the U.S. And lastly, and this is really, really important, it's about having a low energy source. So in the U.S. right now, natural gas is at approximately 30-year low. Okay. So the way to think about it is adjusted for inflation, Natural gas is so, so cheap, it's approximately eight times cheaper than in Asia or in Europe. Now, if you're going to build some glass for your solar panel, if you're going to build it as cheaply as possible, you need that input to make the glass to be as cheap as possible. And the way to do it is to get the energy to be as cheap as possible and to have a reliable source of energy. And that, at the moment, seems to be happening quite well uh, in the U.S., so it's really, really important to marry up these several trends. You have a decoupling, okay? There's mm-hmm. the geopolitical tensions and the cheap energy source. So there are many different factors here. Now, how do I, as an investor, how do I position that to be a participant in this trend? It's one thing to have an idea. How do I express that idea? Now, the mm-hmm. way I've tried myself to go about it is to indirectly invest in certain companies that are going to benefit from this. For example... I'm invested, let's say, in United States Steel, okay? So Mm -hmm. that is a company that has a clean balance sheet, meaningful liabilities happening in 2029. So at the end of this decade, right? So I have a very strong balance sheet. It's a business that is working very hard to cut back on operating expenses. And also, on top of that, starting next year, they're going to cut back on their CapEx because they just rolled out a massive factory. In the, mm-hmm. They started rolling out Big River Steel 2 this year. So it's it's a very capital-intensive part of the cycle, but starting next year, it's going to be less capital-intensive. So this kind of thing where you have two catalysts working in your favor. So you have the fact that if steel prices remain relatively stable, that's a big question mark, and I don't know if that's going to happen, right? If mm-hmm. steel prices remain relatively stable, just because they're reducing their capex, you're going to end up with more free cash flow. On top of that, if, for example, I am right, to assume that um, energy, that steel prices will come higher as there's more demand for steel, that could be another catalyst. Now, I, you know, mm-hmm. nobody really knows these things. And I could also say the other side of the argument is, hey, uh, China is trying to reduce the amount of uh, property projects that they're unfolding right now. So there's going to be an overabundance of steel. So they are going to just try to take it over from China and export it elsewhere. And that will change the supply and demand dynamic. Now, I could counter that yet again and say, okay, uh, the US is quite aware of that and they're trying to put tariffs on in steel prices. Mm -hmm. So this kind of thing. So there's a trend towards future energy. How do I participate? By looking for companies that A, are very, very cheap. B, and this is critical, in the next two years, are more likely than not to see an inflection in profitability. So Mm -hmm. cheap stock, an inflection in profitability, clean balance sheet. That gives me the staying power Mm -hmm. to kind of, so I don't need to be right this quarter. You know, everyone wants to, whenever you invest, everyone wants to be right within 90 days. It's like 90 days ago, 90 days. Mm -hmm. But that's not really how you make the money. You you know, Warren Buffett's already kind of laid it out for us. Just try 
to be a little bit patient. I'm not saying try to be patient forever. You can make an investment and you can hold, let's say, nine months, a year. You'll know a lot more about your business in a year's time than you do today. But the likelihood that you're going to predict how the next 30 days or the next quarter is going to unfold, it's just, you know, that's a gamble. But if you take an investment and you try your best to say, okay, I'm going to just stay around for a year, in a year's time, you reassess and you say, okay, this is the way it, I thought it was, this is the way it worked out. And you update your forecast with time, right? You're making a decision, you write it down, you say these points, one, two, three is how I think about investing. In this company, mm-hmm. I think the budget is important, this and that. I think the valuation makes sense. And you reassess with time how it is that the thesis is unfolding. So indirectly investing in the energy trend is something that I'm very passionate about. Mm-hmm. Well, definitely, you make a lot of uh, compelling points there. Um, and going back to that thing you said about renewables, it is definitely true that, you know, obviously not as renewable as some people think. Uh, one of the most extreme cases I've heard of is, you know, you get those... Um, uh, wind, uh, wind, um, wind machines, and they they freeze up in the um, in the in the winter. And you actually need to get helicopters up there or something to actually you know take the ice off of them, and obviously burning tons of fuel. I couldn't agree more. They don't last forever, so there are different mm-hmm. estimates to say that these wind turbines may or may not only last twenty years. Now, no one is really actively talking about that because you know. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's just be clear here, right? What we're talking about. When we talk about the energy transition from renewables, we're talking about at this moment in time, 3% of our energy sources come from renewables, okay? So 60% more or less comes from fossil fuels. Let's say 8 10% comes from nuclear. Let's just say 10%, just, just, just make the, com- the conversation simple, right? So you got 3% mm-hmm. after 20 years of uh, us embarking on this energy transition, we got to 3% to change the renewable supply from 3% to 6% and then to 9%, it's like a doubling or tripling in the amount of infrastructure you need. So you need copper, you need aluminium, you need steel, Mm -hmm. you need lithium. This doesn't grow on the trees, right? So Mm -hmm. to get lithium out of the ground, I'm sure you probably, or your listeners have probably heard from Tesla, whatever. It's extremely intensive in terms of the energy that you need. It's extremely Mm -hmm. intensive in terms of the supply of people that are going to go and do those uh, those that digging around in the mines. So Tesla by itself actually tried to buy um, a lithium mine because it's really trying to embrace this what's called manufacturing as a service where they are fully integrated in building mm-hmm. out their cars and buying the car is just a start of your journey, right? So mm-hmm. they want to control as many of the variables as possible so that they can very much optimize their profit mark, their gross profit margins. Because the biggest input into making the car is the lithium battery, right? So if you, Mm -hmm. at the start of it, of the journey, you control your input cost, everything ultimately revolves around the energy that is required to start the process off. So if you control that, if you have some control over that, it just allows you a long distance to have more control over the gross profit margins versus your competitors. Now, it's quite energy intensive to get all these products out from the ground and to it's going to require quite a few different things to happen together. So it's not going to be the kind of thing that's going to happen next year because as I'm discussing, we've been on this journey for 20 years. We don't mm-hmm. have another 40, 60 years to get to 2050. You know, this is like what we can't do, but we need to kind of make some progress to go from mm-hmm. 3% to 6 to 9 because at this moment in time around the world, 2 billion people rely on wood, kind of biomass to heat their homes. So if you look around, Two out of seven people require biomass, like that's dung or wood, to heat their homes. So if we're going to say we're going to have a heat pump, which requires electricity, if we're going to have an EV charging, so we're not going to just go to some kind of garage somewhere and charge our electric vehicle. It's going to come from our house. So all this is power that needs to come from our house. And then on top of all this, everyone is making the assumption that in the West, our we become more and more energy efficient. But I don't know if you've been following this, but in the last several months, everyone has exploded with enthusiasm over AI. So the Mm -hmm. way AI works is extremely energy intensive. The way it takes a lot of data. So you need to build that AI data set, okay? So that's really energy intensive to build all those chips. That's the first part of the problem. Then you need to 
have the energy to actually sustain that and to cool that, okay? So I'll give you just one example. To train ChatGTP3, okay? So it's not even mm -hmm. ChatGTP4. It took the same amount of energy as 200,000 houses used in one year, okay? So if wow. you just look up, let's say, for example, a typical U.S. house. I'm not talking about some house in Afghanistan or whatever. There's a typical U.S. house, 200, basically it's a city. What a city uses mm -hmm. in a year to train ChatGTP to mm -hmm. in one month, okay? Now you have ChatGTP and then you have Google. And then all of a sudden everyone scratches their head. It's like AWS. This is just a logical transition. And then it's like, oh, Azure is going to start deploying it. And then you have Unity. And then you have Netflix. And then everyone's trying to get on this ChatGTP bandwagon. Now, I do not know how this is going to unfold. Everyone is thinking that it's going to be a few big pillars, the same way that it worked with the cloud, which is AWS and Azure, and kind of Google um, Cloud having number three position. Everyone thinks it's just going to be these kind of few bodies. But I feel that everybody's learned from how long it took in terms of investment to build the cloud infrastructure that everyone's like, okay, no, I'm just going to throw all the money I can at this problem. So you can mm -hmm. see there's so much capital chasing this um, AI dream, let's call it hype, that there's going to be so many winners and losers that we're only going to find out later on in, in time, mm -hmm. you know, who's the ultimate winner and loser. But my point remains the same, that Everyone in, in is believing that the West is going to slow down and become more efficient in terms of their energy transition, but I don't believe that's the case. So mm -hmm. finally, this is the point, right? Everyone outside of the, the West wants to live the same quality of life as they do in the US, okay? Everyone wants to have like their wearables. Everyone wants to access their Netflix. Everyone has to have a smartphone. Everyone wants those kind of things. So everyone is trying to aspire and grow their energy consumption while at the same mm -hmm. time, there's a lot more people outside the U.S. than there are in the U.S. So this is a mismatch. There's a, clearly a very large demand for energy that people are not really discussing. So I look at the energy markets today, for example, everything is red. Everyone's like, oh, uh, China is not manufacturing enough. And it's like, yeah, there's clearly a lot of volatility. I will be the first to come clean and say, okay, there is a lot of volatility right now in the energy markets. But that doesn't mean that this is like the status quo because there's clearly mm -hmm. a trend towards more energy. Mm -hmm. consumption and that's something i'm very bullish about how to marry up all these different trends in a way that i'm paying for very cheap assets low multiples to free cash flow clean balance sheets yeah that's um you make very good points there i mean the two catalysts there i think one is maybe a bit uh, more obvious which is of course the um you know, all the the huge amounts of people you know in the more de uh, developing nations that are going to need to catch up and you know people aren't realizing that then very interesting. I didn't realize just how energy intensive that, you know, chat GPT was. And that's also a very, very compelling argument. Now we've talked about various uh, energy, uh, you know, sources. Uh, I was wondering if I could get some you know, different assets. So I was wondering if I could get your take on a few different ones. You mentioned, for example, natural gas being at historical lows. Mm -hmm. Would that then be something that you would go ahead and say, okay, well, I'm going to buy a natural gas company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, precisely. So I own, uh, it's called Antero, which is like a AI is a ticker. So mm -hmm. there are many different natural gas players. Mm -hmm. The reason why I went with Antero is because they are fully unhedged. What that means is that mm -hmm. when, uh, like right now, the natural gas price is really, really low, they, you know, they're not very profitable. I get that. Like I, I mistimed my entry. But that being said, if I believe, which I do believe firmly, and I'll tell you why in a second, that next year natural gas is going to be substantially higher than it is right now, you want a fully unhedged business with a clean balance sheet, okay? Why do I believe mm -hmm. that next year natural gas is going to be higher than it is this year? It is very simple. Right now, prices in Asia and in Europe for natural gas are approximately eight, seven, eight times higher than they are in the US, okay? That's the first thing. So the reason why it's, there's such a discrepancy, including transporting the LNG cargo, is because it's difficult to get it out of the US. So Freeport, it's an LNG terminal that exports out the natural gas, is already running at full capacity. They had about six right. months of, um, they had a fire last year and they had about six months of downtime. So it built up, they had to kind of get rid of as much of that inventory. Now, next year, there's gonna be two new uh, LNG terminals coming online. So that's gonna change about the export capacity from the US by approximately 10%. Now, 
of volume doesn't sound big, but let me just give you an example, okay? If I told you tomorrow morning that there's going to be 10% more supply of oil in the market, you, you just see oil prices tank. And on the other side of the equation, if you knew for sure that tomorrow morning there's going to be 10% more demand for oil, oil would just soar. 10% in these global markets is really a big shift. So mm -hmm. there's going to be concretely two new uh, LNG terminals coming online, one in early 20, 2024, one at the back end of 2024. So there's going to be a lot of this cargo just being exported out. Lastly, if you look, the natural gas price that I'm referring to is the natural gas price on the spot market. That's changing right now. The natural gas price on looking out to the end of December is approximately $4, which is substantially higher than now. You could make the argument that a lot needs to happen between now and the next uh, 12 months or so, next, uh, let's say, actually, let's say the next six, seven months for that natural gas to climb higher to, to, to meet the December contract. Now, I strongly believe that the market, even if the timing isn't precise, the market is trying to see through that and the market is trying to form some view of what 2024 looks like. So as you, I, if you notice in my response, I've not talked at all about the Russian aspect because everyone mm -hmm. talks about that when it comes to natural gas. Let's just forget mm -hmm. that. Right? that. That may happen. It may not. Uh, Europe might have be quite cold. Um, it could be the case that in... Um, at the end of this, uh, around this December time, this winter, that not only Europe, but Asia are competing for those uh, natural gas uh, cargoes. It could be the mm -hmm. case, but let's pretend that's not the case. Let's just pretend that there's an arbitrage. There shouldn't be a price discrepancy for a commodity of approximately seven times, including the transport across. So the only rate limitation is trying to get that uh, cargo out of the US. Mm -hmm. That's a very good point, and I'm you know I'm quite happy that you mentioned Antero Resources. Obviously, it's one of uh, one of the stocks that I've owned before and written written extensively about. And natural gas is something that I've been quite bullish on, especially over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I also recently uh, bought some Vermilion Energy. I don't know if you're familiar I with know that company. This company very very well. Uh, so Vermilion Energy. Okay, so their management um, made a few mistakes. Mm -hmm. Let's say like that. Um, they had one capital allocation strategy in a Q2 2022, which is like six months, like two quarters ago, pretty much. And they were like, okay, we're going to buy back shares and this and that. And then mm -hmm. all of a sudden they said, actually, no, um, all of a sudden we, like, we're going to stop all these kind of buybacks and we're going to just uh, shore up money for the windfall tax. Now, I get it, right? I, you know, I'm an investor. I get it that they needed to shore up their balance sheet. But the way they mm -hmm. went about it and just kind of changed direction like this, it showed mm -hmm. to me that this is just a hobby for them. It's not serious. Now, yeah. now I'll caveat this yet again. Okay, listen. It's a very, very cheap company. If I pretend for the sake of our discussion that uh, in 2024, like in six, seven months time, the windfall taxes in Europe roll off, which I believe may happen. If I pretend that is the case, this company trades at approximately three or four times free cash flow. If you believe, which I do, that a uh, European uh, natural gas prices stay around $30 per megawatt hour. Right now, they're approximately 36. So there's a tiny bit of margin safety. But so three or four times free cash flow, including um, if you assume the windfall taxes roll off. If they don't roll off, that, like that trade just died. But if, you know, if, mm -hmm. if, if European governments come back and say, oh, you know, uh, let's get, get, get more taxes out of these people. But if they don't, which I, I think it's a very logical, I don't believe that in Europe, they're once again going to come back because, you know, many um, many of the major oil companies have said, actually, we're going to reduce our investment, particularly in the UK, because uh, we don't know if we're going to get that capital out. And once there's a precedent to say, ah, you know, there's going to be windfall tax, it's like, you, what's the, you, if you have a certain amount of capital, if you're the head of Exxon or whatever, you have a certain amount of capital, you need to think, is that capital going to come back to the company as a shareholder or is that company capital going to go to taxes to some other country? So I feel that this precedent of them having this windfall tax actually um, inhibits some incentive to invest in Europe, get it mm -hmm. in, in, in natural gas. So I'll just caveat this slightly. Okay. So Vermilion is not a pure play um, on Europe. It does hold some uh, Canadian mm -hmm. assets. That being said, approximately 55% of their free cash flow 
comes from uh, Europe, from mm-hmm. Europe. So it's kind of yes, it is. This has some kind of the base as well, but it's you know the bulk here of the thesis is really contingent on uh, how Europe unfolds. And if it, if that windfall tax rolls up, I feel that this you know it's relatively cheap. Now I um, people have many opinions on Eric Nuthall, uh and I welcome those opinions. Um, you know, his record speaks for himself. Uh, he's it's his biggest position, uh, and you know, uh, so it's, I'm not saying that just because you know Eric or Warren Buffett own something that that is a reason why it's going to work out. You know, everyone's mm-hmm. human in this game. You have to be quite independent in your thought process. But I feel that paying around three, four times cash flow. The way to think about it is, if I were to buy Vermilion today, and things were to remain relatively stable, which is a question mark, of course. But it was to remain relatively stable for four years. After four years, this business trades for free. So if I was to hold this business hypothetically for eight years, I make my money back on the first four years. And after that period, I hold it as long as I want. And that's just free upside to me. Mm-hmm. They may or may not decide that they might use some of that free cash flow to repurchase shares, which would accelerate the pace at which I would make my return on investment. So... There is a few angles. There's some pros and some cons. It's uh, nothing mm. is simple investing. There's always two sides right. of the argument. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, like you say, there's, there's a reason why it's so cheap. Um, you know, you have to you have to take that you have to take that risk. Now, I would like to get your thoughts um, on nuclear energy because you know nuclear energy has been you know for a long time held as the kind of the panacea, and we're seeing some kind of return to to it. Uh, what are your thoughts on nuclear energy and maybe uranium as well? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, simple. Ultimately, everything is contingent on uranium prices reaching 60. Okay, let's just cut it how it is. Okay, now, why is uranium in a 10, 11 years uh, bear market? Because there's a lot of excess supply in the secondary markets and nobody knows how much is left. People can speculate and say Mm -hmm. and articulate and be very silver tongued and come up with all kinds of hypotheses about how many pounds are produced per year, what's the demand for uranium, blah, blah, blah. The fact of the matter is we've been in this position for several years, and for several years there's a lot of secondary inventory coming online. That being said, we're recording this in um, in May, uh, and it appears right now that uranium prices are just crossed above 50, which is the first time that it's kind of stayed around there, and obviously a lot of people are very bullish about that. I also own a position which is Uranium Energy Corp, uh, so I'm also quite bullish here, but I think it's important to think about this in the grand scheme that nobody really knows. And this hypothesis that uh, uranium would be above 60 has been around for, for quite a lot of quarters right mm. now. And I'll just say what's further, that in the case that uranium prices were to go above 60, I believe the best way to play this would be on unhedged business so a lot of people like to buy the sprot which is an etf that trades in the us and the sprot can only trade commensurate with the price of uranium uh, tamiko mm-hmm. is the only people look at but tamiko is contracted out at approximately 61 dollars per pound now if you believe which i do believe that nuclear energy could be um, an energy supply source for some countries not all countries around the world will need it china is very much embarking on this nuclear transition uh, the U.S. starting slowly, but not every country is going to need, uh, going to embrace nuclear as much as uh, other countries. But if you do believe, which I do believe, that it's important that um, to be a participant in the uranium market, it's important to be placed in an unhedged business that has no uh, no debt. So it's like a long term option. You know, you kind of buy your position. You have to your time be a bit patient. It's not going to happen next quarter, the quarter afterwards. But if you just Wait around sixty dollars. Once that's sixty, something a lot of those uranium companies can start to uh, roll out their production. Now you could also make the counter argument that once they start rolling out their production, there would be a lot of um, supply hitting the market, which would once again depress the uranium price. But then I'll caveat that yet again that China is at the front of this uranium transition, and they have mm-hmm. a lot of uh, small modular reactors coming online this year. So. It could be the case that once a lot of countries say, okay, you know, why should China have to access to cheap energy? Maybe maybe places like Germany will think, mm-hmm. rethink, 
hmm, I don't mind having some cheap energy. Nothing wrong with having a little bit of cheap energy. Maybe Britain. Britain also made some very small uh, funds available for this nuclear transition. So maybe they'll say as well, you know, I wouldn't mind having some, some cheap energy. They kind of just look around and once they see the Chinese has very cheap access to cheap energy, they, everyone may embark on this uh, energy transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely a, a very good point. And if you have time for one more question, kind of uh, just switching subjects a little bit, because you also uh, write a bit about tech stocks. And I saw a recent article you wrote on Airbnb, which of mm -hmm. course uh, published earnings quite recently. There was a mm -hmm. bit of a, a, a drop in the stock price. Um, just would love to hear your thoughts there. Yeah, so, so I believe, and there are different theories around, but I believe it's very important when you invest Try your best to invest in a business that is stable. It's much better for you to go for a business that may or may not grow by 1% rather than try to go for a business that can grow 50% or may not. You know, those 50-50 mm -hmm. bets are not great. It's better to go for a safe option. Now, the way that Airbnb works is that you make a booking today and in six months' time, you go to the property. But you, they take the cash up front and then they mm -hmm. return that cash to the, to the host of the property in six months time once the guest checks in now so that gives you very strong net mm. uh, very strong negative working capital that means cash up front so their free cash flow goes ahead of their mm -hmm. profitability now the way this transpires is that the business is going to make round about 4.2 billion of free cash flow this year now that puts a stock approximately six times free cash flow now if you look around for uh, global multinational businesses, not many are today trading around 16 times free cash flow. You can say, if you go into commodities, those are much cheaper. But big multinational brands, I don't know of many, that are growing at approximately, on an FX adjusted basis, approximately 20 uh, times, a 20% free cash flow CAGA, a 20% CAGA, and the free cash flow is being priced at a 16 times. So it, a simple way to think about it, if you look at a price earnings multiple, uh, this looks quite cheap relative to the growth you're getting. The other mm -hmm. thing that I'll say is that the business, not only is it making a substantial amount of uh, uh, free cash flow, it also has a relatively strong balance sheet. So it could be the case that this could work out, uh, provided that, it remains relatively, there's no massive recession. So there are, you know, like every business investment, there is some kind of uh, puts and takes. People did not like, which I respect, that, but people did not like the pace of deceleration in their revenue growth rates. This really was, this was, uh, this time last year, if memory says it correctly, it was growing very fast at north of 40%. And then it's just kind of gone really, it just mm -hmm. kind of churned to a halt that on a gap basis. So this is like, this includes the FX headwind. On a gap basis, if they reported a 16 time, 16 percent year over year growth rate, but on a, if you forget about the effect, it's 20 percent uh, the CAGA, the compounded annual growth rate. So, if you have a business that can continue at 20 percent growing for a few years, a lot of good things can happen. You get a lot of positive operating leverage. Well, that's a that's a very good point. You obviously have a very good uh, grasp on the fundamentals. Uh, you know a lot about energy. It's been really great uh, talking to you about that. You've definitely uh, made me feel better about my investments in Antero and uh, the gas companies. Uh, before we before we leave, uh, you can just go ahead and let everyone know uh, where they can find you. Thank you so much. So just Google Deep Value Returns. Okay, great. Well, once again, Michael, thanks for coming on. It's been great having you. And, Thank you know, you. hopefully we can do it again sometime. Thank you so much. Bye. All right. Bye-bye, everyone.